What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Post Game Podcast. I'm here with Corey Smith here with Miles Mastercola, basketball analyst for Pack Pride. Miles, how are you doing, sir? Great, man. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Uh, before we get things started, I want to remind our listeners, as always, visit our iTunes, Google Play Store, give us a rating if you enjoy the podcast, help get the word out there to the rest of Wolfpack Nation. Also, make sure if you're on YouTube, you're watching on Facebook, like and subscribe on either one of those. Uh, and that way, put, hit get notifications, especially on YouTube. That way you can join us every single time we do one of these live, whether it's at 11.45 at night after a game or we're doing it at like, you know, 1 o'clock at, <laughs> after a noon game. So uh, we'll always – we'll try to do this as much as we can. Sometimes, you know, there's, te- there's difficulties uh, and we'll do it later, but uh, we, we always try to do this as much as possible. Also, make sure to check out Pack Pride. Uh, we've got – you know, always have the 30% off deal running. Uh, and also have one dollar off uh, for uh, the month of you know for for an entire month. Anytime you check that out. Um, and the last thing I got to read here too, um, we've got a a new advertiser joining us. If for those that haven't noticed, up in the uh, the top right corner there, uh, the Scottwood Home Lending Team uh, joined us, and, and they're going to be an advertiser for us throughout the year, uh, throughout the next several months. Uh, wanted to do a, a quick ad read for them as well. Uh, the Scottwood Home Lending Team. There's something that he can't do. Uh, after a successful <laughs> career at NC State and playing professional basketball, Scottwood has turned his sights on conquering the mortgage world. Reach out to him today if you're interested in financing the purchase of or build of your own dream home, uh, looking to purchase your first investment property, or even just buy land. Uh, as an ever-present face in the community, his large network base can help connect you to the perfect builders and realtors out there to make your buying slash building experience as seamless as possible. His vast product base allows for each customer to receive their own tailored loan to fit their needs from the traditional W-2 earner to the unique self-employed business owner. So home ownership is closer than you might think. Great rates. 50 states. Yes, you heard that right. You can get that from anywhere across the country, all 50 states. Uh, Scott's looking forward to sending out these pre-approvals and getting uh, your home journey started. So make sure to check out the Scottwood Home Lending Team. If you haven't seen the little banner running at the bottom, make sure to check that out, scottwood15.com, to find out more information. All right, Miles, let's jump right into this thing because uh, this was a, from the beginning to the very end, uh, I think the only lead that Florida State held was two to zero, and then NC State went on a, I believe, fifteen to two run, and then just a lot to a little run. Uh, it got to a point. I think the biggest it got was uh, thirty points at multiple occasions. Uh, there was one point where it was forty four to fourteen in the first half, and then in the second half they ran away with it again. Uh, just your thoughts on this win overall? I mean, it was a dominant win, and it needed to be dominant, right? Yeah, and that's kind of what we talked about right before we went on. Like winning these games, it, it, you you want to do it in a convincing manner, and that's exactly what NC State did. Not quite a wire to wire to win, a wire to wire win, but basically, um, just dominant, and, and it was really, it. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah, and and it was the horses carrying them. Like it was, you know, Burns, Smith, Joyner, and that's really what's been the story through the month of January for this team. Um, and they've just done such an unbelievable job, and all three had their special moments tonight. Yeah, and I mean, we obviously have to start with uh, with Terquavion Smith here. We'll we'll get to the importance of this win in a little bit, and why it needed to be so dominant. Uh, first of all, shout out to Devin who just posted, "Let's go!" <laughs> just just a really long go there. Uh, He's either excited <laughs> about the win or, or Scott Woods home lending team, one of the two. Yes, exactly. Maybe both. Exactly. You always the best advertiser. Um, yeah. But, you know, we were talking about it beforehand, and it's like, all right, where do we go with this? Well, I guess, first of all, we start with Terquavion Smith. You know, 10 of 24 on the night. Uh, So, you know, not greatly efficient, but a good shooting night. But from three-point range, he was 6 of 10, uh, went 6 of 9 from the free throw line, which is a nice line there, too. And then Mm -hmm. five rebounds, three assists, and he did all that in 33 minutes with a plus-minus, which, as you can almost predict in this one, a plus-minus of 29. So... Uh, that's a that's a decent night for him, and it didn't feel like he just did it, you know, offensively too. I mean, defensively, uh, he was keeping Caleb Mills at bay uh, throughout the night. This was a just a really strong night for him overall, right? Yeah, and, and when he gets into the shot making bag of tricks like he did tonight, 
that's just what opens everything up. And and I think the last shot he hit kind of summed up the night for him. I think he was a little frustrated. He didn't get the ball. He was trying to get to that 30-point clip and, and got it and just drove a step back three. But, nah, he he just was in control. And, you know, there were some good looks that he had that he didn't wasn't able to connect on. And 10 to 24, he could still improve on that. But just did such a good job getting the, the those, like, back-breaking shots to fall. Um, mm-hmm. that continued to kind of take away Florida State's will to win, that even if you score on one end, T's going to come down and hit a crazy shot and, and run back down the floor celebrating. And it's, it's just kind of deflating for a team to deal with when you have a player making shots like that. So he just did such a good job with that tonight. And then he's – the three-point shooting is kind, of, is kind of returning to the norm. He didn't start off the first half of the year quite where he was last year. Um, I think he's kind of gotten up closer to 35% now where it was around 32. So if that continues to climb and he's able to knock their shots down consistently, it's only going to open things up as NC State keeps rolling and they're about to get two guys back here probably by the end of the month. Yeah, I mean, you shoot 60% from three-point range. That's that's a pretty decent night. Uh, you know, you look, I don't know what it is. And it's funny, we were talking, you know, we obviously talked about Scott Wood uh, early on. But like Scott Wood was known as the the Florida State killer. Like every single time they faced Florida State, he just hit those corner threes uh, and, you know, consistently was able to, to beat up on them. Traquavion Smith has only played three games against Florida State. He's never had less than 23 points against them. He had 23 in the first game he had against them last year. He had 30 the next time and he had 32 tonight. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm not very good at average. I'm not very good with numbers, like, on the fly. But let's see, that's, what, 55 plus 30. Yeah, that's like – I mean, he's averaging, like, 27, 28 points per game against Florida State. Uh, which is, you know, just a, a ridiculous number uh, going, you know, for, for a guy that's only played them three times. Uh, so I, I don't know what it is about Florida State, and I don't know what it is about the matchups there. Obviously, Florida State prides themselves on being a really athletic team, very similar to NC State, but the defense just has not been there on, on Traquavion Smith. No, and, and, and it's kind of one of those things, too, where, like, T, the shots T's going to get are almost kind of going to be what they are on any given night. Maybe it's maybe it's something about Florida State, the way that they've recruited, and he he's a kid that typically probably would have played well there, and he always is a very good self motivator, and um, you know they're down this year, but in the last you know half dozen or so years, they're probably one of the four or five best programs in the conference. So you know you get that target on your back with the brand that they built, and T's made him pay every single time he suited up against them. Yeah, and I was gonna say, speaking of motivation, uh, the, the next guy on the scoring sheet here for NC State, DJ Burns. Uh, five of six, got 15 points on the night, and that was because of the fact they went five of five from the free throw line. Uh, also had three assists, tying to Quavion Smith. We talked so much about you know the fact that his you know his ability to be able to find open the open man is just unreal for a guy his size. He did all that in 19 minutes because he was in foul trouble, you know foul trouble late in the the first half, and then you know, picked up two fouls in the second half. So it was dealing with you know playing with four fouls there late in the game. Uh, but we speak about the motivation, Miles. I don't know if you had seen this, but uh, when he was part of the 2019 class, uh, he had a had an offer from Florida State, had them inside of his top three, and you know said that that was one of the schools that he was he was seriously looking at. Uh, and then come to find out, when he reclassed to 2018, they pulled the offer from him. So. That that was some extra motivation for him going into this game, and you could see it early on. It was, it was he was almost doing too much at times, but mm-hmm. I mean, backing dudes down from the three point line. I just at some point, I'd love to see him do it from the logo, right? I, I when I watch DJ like his touches tonight, I'm like, this kid, his confidence is just through the roof right now. Like he he really yeah. feels like he's unstoppable, and it's translating. Like he's he's willing it into existence. Um, just he's just so efficient when he touches the ball. Like the offense is just it, the results are so good when it's run through him, and the fact that they're able to you know it was partially due to foul trouble, but a lot due to the result as well. He only played 19 minutes tonight, was still able to put up kind of his regular type numbers, and uh, and now he you know doesn't have the heavy load of bearing those minutes as uh, as they get ready for Georgia Tech this weekend. So that's like the other advantage of, of a situation like this. Like you get to to get guys breaks. So DJ Burns kind of was a recipient of that lot, lot, largely due to the foul trouble too, but he was just so good. And he made all of his free throws, which is another good sign for him. Yeah. I mean, again, 
state one of the issues they had in that game against Wake Forest over the weekend. You know, they, they were able to pull out the win, but uh, they struggled shooting the f- from the free throw line. You know, Traquavion Smith, as I said, six of nine, uh, and really the two, you know, the two of the biggest misses were he, he got fouled on a three point attempt early in the game, uh, missed the first two, and then made them. So he finished, you know, making six of his last seven overall. So you, you take those two first two away, but again, that's uh, that's not something that you do in a game. So yeah. uh, you now I feel like if he was able to, if he's if he's a little more consistent, you know, the team overall finished eighteen to twenty three. Uh, and you know, EB Duana missed the other two, so that's kind of where this team is at right now. And I, I, we had a question right afterwards when I was on here with Brian, it was like, you know, asking about the, the issues with free throw shooting. I was like, I really don't think there's issues with free, free throw shooting. He's had a bad night, uh, for the charity stripe. They're, they're typically a really good team, you know, we're not a really good team, but like, you know, just outside of the top 100 out of 300 and how many ever odd teams there are. Uh, so it's not a, it's not a bad number for them. Uh, and I, I don't think it's been an issue at times. So, uh, just a, a good night again. And, and again, like you said, it's good to see that from DJ Burns because when big men are hitting free throws, you know, that, that typically helps uh, and, and alleviates some of the pressure on, on the guards because uh, then they know they can get some opportunities late in games because you don't know who to foul. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just looked real quick. They're shooting 71.9% from the line all yeah. the year. And that, so, that dropped significantly because it was like 73.8 before the weight game. Yeah, so they're like average to above average. I wouldn't say the free throws are like a, a problem at this point yeah. at all. Yeah, because I think they shot like like forty something percent in that game against yeah, that Wake. Bad. Yeah, that was a, yeah, that, that was did bad. not help. But again, that's you know that's not been the norm for this team. Um, all right, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, about the guard play in this one too. I mean, outside of Jaquavion Smith, Arkell Joyner, five of twelve overall, finished three of five from the. Behind the arc, you know, this team overall shot the ball extremely well. Uh, you know, 60% from behind the arc, 12 of 20 uh, overall. And then, like we said, like 48% from uh, the field in general. You know, th- they did everything just about right. Everything that you could ask for. Won the rebounding battle 41 to, uh, let's see, I don't even know what Florida State finished with. 41 to 28. And again, we're still talking about a team that's down its top two rebounders. Uh, so, First of all, before because I really want to talk about Greg Gant here in just a second because I I felt like he put on a really strong performance in this one. But uh, just your thoughts on on the efficiency again from from the guards outside of Traquavion Smith uh, that you know helped him to be able to find opportunities because Jarkel Joyner we know has been playing well so far this season. Casey Morsell, you know four of eight. His shot's been a little bit off recently, but going four of eight for him and and making one of his three pointers uh, that seemed to really help this team as well. Yeah, they both did a great job, and I thought the biggest thing is Jarkel is such a stabilizer in so many ways. Um, whenever they have a few possessions kind of not go the way they want, it feels like Jarkel finds a way to settle them down, and that's largely due to his ability to create for himself and his efficiency getting to his spots. And, you know, it's usually the mid-range that's the most reliable, but tonight it was from three, hit three or five from deep. Um, I thought LJ Thomas gave him good minutes. He came off the bench yeah. and, and provided a spark. Um, showed that he can – I know that late play, I think he crossed the guy up at a long two. Um, showed that he can has potential as a creator and stuff that I know when you and I watched him when he was in high school and playing travel ball that we saw a lot of that may not have been showcased with this team as much this year. And Breon gave him some good minutes as well. So just a good set of minutes and, and just good quality production. Casey Morsell, not a high volume, rebounds, finds a way. We already know mm-hmm. what he's going to do as a defender. Um, still as efficient with the touches that he does get. So yeah, it was just it was just great, and they did exactly what they needed for them to perform. It's like twelve away from this not it's a replicatable thing in the world, but you still take it when you get it. Yeah, and you mentioned L.J. Thomas, seven points from him tonight. You know, he's just getting those sneaky, you know, sneaky good uh, possessions. Like, you know, basically hit. You know, not necessarily the game winner, but. Was the you know, what put him over the top? Yeah, he cl- hit that clutch three in place of Traquavion Smith in that game on Saturday, and then tonight, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what point it was, uh, but I just remember when he hit the shot. It was like around the time, yeah, that was it was with 33 seconds left to go in the first half. You know, State had kind of let them, you know, get back in the game, uh, and you know he subbed in and immediately went down the court, uh, drew a, an and one. Uh, hit the you know hit the layup and then ended up hitting the shot or the free throw 
uh, to kind of stabilize things for NC State. Again, you know, <laughs> it put them up 24 at that point. But yeah, you know, there was there was a, a, a lull there where they had you know just not been able to find anything offensively and let Florida State do everything they wanted to on the defensive end, uh, and that kind of allowed NC State to you know to stabilize things before you go into the locker room and, and have some good on the, the end of the score sheet there too. So uh, again, like you said, a good night for, uh, for LJ Thomas in this one, uh, you know, you and you and Brian, I think are like fan number one and number two uh, for him at the very top of the list. I'm sure there's some others out there as well, but uh, yeah, you know, just, probably Lyron senior is up there too. Yes. Yes. Dad, well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> us three are I mean, leading like in the charge. Of, yeah. I mean like in terms of the media as well, but um, yeah. Well, it's, it's easy to see, and, and, you know, I've seen him for a while. I'm sure Brian keeps up with the grassroots stuff and kind of paid attention, like, yeah, you know, it, it, he's he's got a chance to be a really, really good player in his time in Raleigh. Yeah, and, I mean, he essentially took off an entire year of basketball, too. Like, I think people kind of forget that. He wasn't able to play at Bull City Prep uh, after transferring there and, you know, wasn't able to play at all last year. So, uh, yeah. it's a, a, you know, it's been a, a really, really good year for him and shows flashes. It kind of reminds me of, you know, these aren't good things, you know, <laughs> it wasn't a good season overall, but it reminds me of like, you know, Dennis Smith was very clearly the, you know, the top guard uh, in that, you know, that last season for Mark Godfrey. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you just kind of had Mark L. Johnson. Every time he came in, everybody's like, Mark L. Johnson's going to be really good. Like this guy's going to be really, really good. Not to say that like LJ Thomas is, is Mark L. Johnson. I don't think he is. He's more, he's going to be more of a shooting guard and a shot creator, but you've got a guy that, that's coming off the bench that you're like, he, he may not be Terquavion Smith, but he's going to be pretty damn good. So, um, Yeah, it's, it's like the yeah. quick, like, simple identification. Oh, yeah. he's a player. Yeah, he's a player. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Plus that, you know, he comes off the bench, and he's, he's just a big dude for a guard as well. I mean, we've talked about that as well, just the, the muscle mass for him and, the you know, the strength that he has being able to drive in the lane uh, is, you know, I would put it up there with anybody else on the rest of the team. Uh, he's just got to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, have that confidence to be able to do that on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Guy that I really want to talk about in this one, Greg Gant. Uh, you know, you look at the stat sheet, you're like, okay, five points. He shot the ball well, kind of got a prayer three-pointer. He doesn't normally normally hit those. Uh, that's just how good of a night it was for NC State. But, you know, the six rebounds for him and just the, like, just ridiculous – like pressure that he puts on on defender or on uh, opposing offensive players as a defender, uh, finished with three steals in this game, but you know just frustrated the living hell out of anybody that he was on, anybody he was switching on against Florida State. Uh, just your thoughts on on his performance and how big he's been for NC State uh, throughout these you know this last month now uh, that Jack Clark's been out. Yeah, I think. Um... I think the biggest thing, I think we hear the term like connector a lot in basketball um, when it comes to guys offensively, the, ba the the hockey assist guys, stuff like that. He's such a defensive connector with how seamlessly, how seamlessly he's able to switch and how you really don't even have to second guess it when he's switching on to someone. Um, combined with the energy, the rebounding, um, the fact that he can be a baseline cutter. Um and he also does a good job making those extra passes on the offensive end when he does get the ball, despite not being a real shot-making threat and not being the best guy maybe for spacing. He's still able to overcome that with a lot of the other things he does on the floor and just can, has just done such a good job stepping up. And I think that for a lot of people has probably been one of the bigger surprises with Clark going out that, that Gant has come in. And they're different players. They do different things. But it, he's done his job to a T for this team in just about every game. I think the Notre Dame game, he struggled a little bit, but other than that, he's been perfect. Yeah. You mentioned the, uh, the defensive connector. Uh, <laughs> if you, if you had a stat for like the, the hockey, you know, the, the hockey assist work, like if you had a hockey rebound uh, for NC state, like he would be up there on the list too. There's just so many times where he goes up and, and can't quite get both hands on it, but he just tips it out. Like he, he yeah. realizes you know, hey, my guy's spacing it. This is where he's going to be. I can be able to get the ball up the court a lot quicker if I can find, you know, if I can tip it out to Jaquavion or I can tip it out to Jarkel Joyner uh, and they can go create. Like, it's great to be able to pull down the rebound, but then, you know, the other team's able to set up defensively. It's almost like this is – this almost works better for Kevin Keats' system because you want so badly to be able to get out in transition. If you're able to tip it out, you know, you potentially have two guys – on the defense underneath the floor, you know, on the, or the opposing offense underneath the floor, 
uh, and you'd be able to just kind of push it out and, and push the ball at the court, right? Yeah, 100%. And that plays a factor. And on the offensive glass, he's tipping it out to uh, to get, you know, inside out three point looks. But I yeah. think like the other thing with Greg, too, is, you know, he's a veteran guy. He's been in big games before. I think that his teammates really, really like him and respect him. And I think they respect the amount of work that he's put in to get back on the court after dealing with the injuries last season and even early into the season that when he's out there and just bringing that kind of energy to the table, that everyone on the floor has to match it. Um, and I think that's kind of an intangible quality that um, is another reason why you're seeing the elevated defensive play of guys around him when he's on the floor, not only with what he's actually doing, but kind of the the energy and, and bravado at that end of the floor he's providing for his team. Yeah, and also just the length that he has. And, I mean, the athleticism that he has, he's able to move, you know, <laughs> with his – uh, with the guy that he's defending uh, and just plays him extremely well. I just, I, you know, the, the ball pressure from him is just something that stands out. You know, like I said, the three steals tonight, he's done a really good job of that. And obviously that's something that Jack Clark has been very good at too. Uh, but that's, I just, I know we keep talking about it, but it's like this team, you know, this team has been so good recently and they've, they've been very, very good. But like, I just – I'll be so interested to see where this team is at when you get a guy like Dusan Mahorjic back, when you get a guy like Jack Clark back because of of what they bring and how much, you know, we we know that there's going to be confidence from Greg Gant coming off the bench. We know there's going to be confidence from Ernest Ross coming off the bench. There's confidence from so many guys. LJ Thomas now at this point coming off the bench. Uh, and obviously, you know, with, with guys like DJ Burns, you know, Coming off the bench, I don't know. I don't know how exactly that's going to work out. But even if DJ Burns comes off the bench, which he seems more than comfortable doing, like uh, you know, <laughs> the guy only played 19 minutes and I net 15 points. So uh, even if you only play 15 to 20 minutes for him and 15 to 20 minutes for uh, for a guy like you know for a guy like Dusan Mahorčić, uh, that's massive. And also, uh, as David brings up here, he said if we can keep Burns out of foul trouble, uh, the droughts are non-void. Haven't seen a team come at you in waves. Let's get healthy and win this. Yeah, win the Natty this year. Uh, and and again, that goes back to what I was just saying. Like, you know, if even if at that point, even if Burns gets in foul trouble like he did tonight, you got Dusha Mahorchic. If if you know a guy like Greg Gant gets in foul trouble, you know you got Jack Clark. Like, it's just it makes this team so much different uh, when you know that you have the not just the bodies. Like, you're not just putting bodies out there. That's that's. What I think Kevin Keats's team has struggled with in the past is, you know, he's had 10 guys that he goes into the year and he's like, all right, these guys are all going to be good. And then he ends up winning, whittling it down to like seven or eight because two or three of them don't really fit and, and they don't have the confidence. You know, as much as the injuries suck, like this team is is going to be ridiculously deep over the next couple of weeks. No, I mean, they could legitimately be like 11 deep. Like, that's the craziest thing, like, yeah. If, if, if I guess by default, like EB or Breon is kind of the last one or two off the bench, like both those guys can come in for five minutes and hold it down. And that's kind of like yeah. the, the, the beauty of getting those guys back. And, you know, hopefully we see more nights where Terquavion Smith and Jarkel Joyner are at 30 minutes a game, 31 minutes a game, um, where they can just have that much juice left in the tank to close it out. And I think that's a big part of it too, because now, you you feel comfortable enough to let Breon and LJ hold it down for you know seven minutes, four minutes, one half, three minutes, and another, and they they don't those guys don't have to play as much. You can go bigger lineups now. You can play Jack, Greg, and DJ Burns, or Jack, Greg, and uh, Mahorchich. You need someone to come in and protect the rim. EB's proven to be the best like true rim anchor defender. He can come in and do that for five minutes. So I think that's kind of the. This, oh, in a way, if everyone comes back healthy and stays healthy, this can be a blessing in disguise in a lot of ways because it's allowed guys to become comfortable in the role. And it feels like it's a mature team. I feel like I, I don't think they're going to have that much of an issue, you know, dealing with the egos of because all these guys have egos. They're all big time college basketball players, you know, but I don't think it's going to be an issue with them putting that aside to see what this team can actually accomplish. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things I was going to say too. You know, you look at where this team is at right now. Like, again, this is a team that when you found out Jack Clark wasn't going to be available against Duke, like this was almost a month ago now at this point, everybody's just kind of going, all right, well, they're one and three. They're going to keep, they're going to lose several games now because they don't have either one of those guys. Uh, this, this is now an eight and four team in ACC play, 
18 and five overall. Uh, went from a one and three team to now eight and four, and a, another three game winning streak after having a four game winning streak prior to you know, to Carolina. It would be really nice to have that one because now you'd be at nine and three, uh, and and you know pushing on the door uh, of being you know inside the top three. This team is now tied with Miami uh, inside the top four. Uh, for the ACC, which is you know that magic number. That's what you need. You you want to be a a top four seed once ACC tournament starts. Uh, the benefit for NC State right now is the fact that they have one more win overall uh, than Miami, uh, which you know could come in handy. I guess at the end of the season, we'll see exactly what the tiebreakers are because I know they split the season series. Uh, NC State, you know, right now with Miami being eight and four, both of them. Uh, I don't know exactly what the dynamic would be there, but you know, we're still talking about something that's going to happen eight games from now. So, yeah, uh, it's just a it, it's it's a really I mean, obviously, I think we all knew that this team could be good. But like this has been a really pleasant surprise in the sense that, you know, this team is not just folded and and given up uh, and not to say that they were ever going to give up. But like just to the point where this team is not only rebounded, but like has has become like one of the best it's elevated. Teams. Yeah, and I mean they're one of the best teams, you know, in the ACC right now. Like, and uh, you know, it's it's it almost feels weird to say that still because of you know the way that things went last year. But like, this isn't last year. This team is eighteen and five, uh, eight and four in ACC play, uh, twelve and one at home. The only lo- the only home loss they have uh, is to Pitt, who helped NC State's case tonight by beating UNC and dropping them down to seven and four. So uh, this is a this. Just another really, really big win for NC State and, and helps to push them over the top and in a place that I don't think many NC State fans thought would have been possible, you know, on January 2nd. Yeah, so I'm looking at the ACC standings right now. If I were to tell you that, like, after that pit, those Pitt and Clemson games, I think those were the first two games to start the conference, too, that Clemson would be sitting at 10-2 and two and Pitt at 9-3 and three in the ACC. Yeah. What would you tell me if I told you that? Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and the other one was Miami, and Miami is obviously tied with NC State right now. Yeah. All three of those teams are in the top five. So, <laughs> like yeah, with UVA I mean, coming early next week, I believe, or mid next week, I think a week from tonight, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, this is a, I mean, this is a really, really good spot for NC State to be in. Again, you know, I wrote about it earlier, like the fact that the, you can't take your foot off the pedal for this, you know, for, for NC State right now. And one of the major reasons why is simply because of the fact that you had a game, a team like Florida State coming in, you know, that's now five and six, or I believe five and seven now in, conference, in ACC play after a rough start to the year. So they have been playing good basketball. Georgia Tech has always just been a weird matchup for NC State. They're one eleven in ACC play, but their one win they had was against a really good team, if I remember correctly. I want to say yep. was it was it Clemson? Who was it that they beat? It was Miami. Miami. That's right. That's right. So. They beat Miami. That that's their one. Georgia Tech did uh, did lose to Louisville tonight, for, for what it's worth. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I think they okay, had two well, starters out, but okay, they and they lost by ten. So, ouch! All right. Yeah, Kenny Payne, baby. One. Congratulations, first ACC win. I didn't see that one, boy. That one, yeah. uh, that one got buried somewhere. I guess on ACC Network Extra that they didn't put it on on that. Yeah, it was, it was on. Um, it was on. Uh, I almost made a joke about the the company, some filings they just made last week. But I was going to say uh, Bally Sports. Uh, uh, I think it was on. I think it was our friends at Bally. Uh, Jalen Withers, nineteen and thirteen for Louisville in the win. So, Whew. all right, um, all right. Well, let's. I'm going to toss a couple of these up here too. Uh, let's see. SW Wonder said, what's up, fellas? Great win. And dare I say, this is the best state basketball team, uh, in at least 10 years. Hell, maybe the Hodge years. Yeah. I, you know, I would say at the very least, the most exciting, like this team has just been really, really fun to watch and keep track of. Like, obviously you knew going into the year to Quavion Smith, it was going to be to Quavion Smith. He's, he's had his lulls uh, and people have gotten, you know, upset about him, whatever, but <laughs> This is, you know, he's been phenomenal at times, and you saw it again tonight. Uh, you know, Jarkel Joyner, uh, the play that he's had and, and, you know, the excitement that he brings on and off the court too uh, has been really fun. DJ Burns, obviously, just the, you know, the teddy bear that everybody loves uh, to watch play. So, uh, and then, you know, you've got all these other guys that, that fans are starting to, you know, really fall in love with. Like, you know, the play of Greg Gant, respecting him for what he, you know, what he's able to do for this team. 
Obviously, you know, people love Dushan Mahorchich early on in the season. I'm sure once he comes back, it's not going to be any different. Uh, and then Casey Morsell, him having, you know, just a, a completely different season than he's ever had at the college level. D these are all things that factor into this team just being just a really, really good team. And I think, uh, you know, they're, they're still – I feel like we go through these highs of, like, right after a win, it's like, all right, yeah, this team is great. This team is great. And then we start kind of going – you know, the, the, the following days leading up to the next one, like, all right, just don't lose this one. Just don't lose it. <laughs> like, you yeah. still kind of go through that, right? And and the way college basketball is, like, you can always lose that next one. Like, yeah. Like, I think State will beat Georgia Tech. I'm going to put that on. I think they'll win. But they could lose. That's a, <laughs> that's a realistic yeah. possibility. Um, so he was said, okay, I'll, that, that question kind of got my brain working. And I actually just thought of this. I think this is probably – this or the 2015 team. Um, I think it was the one year Trevor Lacey was playing. There's a lot of, like, similarities between those two teams. You got, like, an yeah. SEC transfer guard that just makes shots. You have the the, the kind of homegrown sophomore guard coming into his own. Cat Barber, Quavion Smith. Uh, yeah, there's, a, it's, there's definitely some parallels, and I feel like both those teams played a pretty exciting and uh, an aggressive brand of basketball so in their own way. Obviously, very different, but um, some similarities too. Yeah, and no, I agree with you there. And I want to say, BJ Ani was pretty good on that team too. Not not that was nearly, his best year. Yeah, I was going to say kind of kind of for opposite reasons. He was good off. He was good offensively, but you know he had the I think set, that year I think set the NC State uh, blocks record too uh, for a single season. So that was a uh, a pretty yeah. That team made the Sweet Sixteen. Yeah, exactly. So. You know, crazier things have happened, uh, and this this team really feels like it has the makeup to be able to make uh, some some deep runs. Uh, and as you said here, he said Virginia game will definitely be a test. Yeah, you, know, you got to get past Georgia Tech obviously first, but man, next Tuesday, you know, NC State has played really really well in Charlottesville the last couple of years. It was a house of horrors before that, uh, but you know they've won the last I want to say two, maybe three in a row there. Uh, and, and that was, you know, we're including last year where they were, you know, the team overall was horrendously bad and they were able to pull that one out early in ACC play. So, and I, I don't think NC State's a good matchup for Virginia. I think Virginia is going to have their hands full. I think yeah. Virginia is a really good team. Um, and maybe if they play a second time a little bit differently with Tony Bennett's just, I mean, he's, I think he, at this point, it's, it's pretty safe to say he's the face of the ACC from a coach's perspective. Um, and for good reason, he's earned that. But it's going to be tough for them just with the one-on-one -on -one creation ability that on this NC State team. So that's it's could be tough. Well, yeah, that and again, you know, all the extra possessions that the state team is is creating. Like, yeah, go back to it. We've talked about it so much. Uh, NC State shot 13 more shots than than Florida State did tonight. Obviously, you know, 10 of those uh, being three pointers. They they outpaced them 20 to 10 uh, in three pointers and. You know, big reason why, again, NC State creating 13 turnovers, 18 points off of those turnovers. As we said, the rebounding battle, 41 to 28 for NC State. Those those all create those extra opportunities for NC State. And that's something they've done so well throughout the season. So you know, this Virginia team relies on, on just being able to be really, really efficient on the offensive end and then frustrate you defensively and not allow you to be able to make these tough shots. You know, this NC State team – I mean, you know, maybe it'll be a little bit different. They'll have to hit some shots and be efficient on offense. But uh, this is a, an NC State team that has been able to, you know, lengthen every almost every single offensive possession they have and, and continue to, uh, you know, be able to, to shoot well offensively too. Yeah. Now it's – it'll be a test for sure. They got to – obviously can't look ahead. We can't look ahead either because, like I just said, Georgia Tech, anybody could beat anybody in college basketball these days. So mm – -hmm. But we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Well, and again, wrapping up this one uh, for NC State, you know, 94 to 66 win. There's not really a ton to talk about. It was just not a not a, not a good night for Florida State and a great night for NC State. Uh, but the last thing I wanted to touch on, uh, you know, NC State's probably going to fall five spots in the net tomorrow, even, even <laughs> regardless. I say that tongue in cheek, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if you wake up tomorrow morning and, and they drop five spots. Uh, but, but this is, again, you know, something we talked about beforehand. Like, these are the types of games that you – it's not that, you know, winning them is really going to help you. It does help the resume overall, I still think, regardless, because you're going to look at the end of the season and oh, yeah. that, team, 
a team that has 23 wins compared to a team that has you know, 19 or 20 wins, uh, even if some of them were, were bad wins or you know not great teams that they played, that's still gonna it's still gonna be really tough to push that team with 19 wins over the top of the team with 23 that has you know, some quality wins earlier on in the season. Uh, but the, these are the types of games that you can't lose. Like state as as of right now, I want to say they're eight no in quad three coming into this one. So this I can't remember if this is a quad three or quad four. Honestly, I think at home it would have been a quad four. Uh, so this this has a chance, and they were. 8-0 in quad four as well. So that would put them at 17-0 and between those two you know, quads. And then you have a 5-5 five and five record against Q1 and Q2 opponents. So that's you know, that's going to help NC State in a significant way. If you can keep that, uh, those last two, you can keep those, um, you know, above that, uh, you know, unblemished uh, going into you know, yeah. the ACC tournament. Yeah, definitely. And then I think... I wonder if the the pit win tonight changes anything on the Carolina side. If if you know when they come to Raleigh, if it'll be a quad one or a quad two. But um, yeah, it was. I, I think it's still going to be quad two because they're not inside the top thirty. So for NC oh, okay. State, it would be yeah. a quad. It'll still be a quad one. I mean, a quad two. I think regardless, they're pretty far off off that, um, you know that line there. So. If I remember correctly, I don't have it in front of me right now, but but they're not they're not <laughs> really close uh, on that line. So I think they're like somewhere around. I think they're behind NC State still right now, somewhere around like forty four or forty five. So they need to jump like fifteen spots in order for that to eventually be a quad one win. It's it's get, you're getting a little nervous about Duke as well because uh, Duke is like twenty three or twenty four in the net. If they drop below thirty, then suddenly you lose another Q uh, one win. And then the Wake Forest win that they just had on Wait, the road. So you're, so you're telling me that NC State fans are going to watch the Carolina Duke game and, and root for Duke on Saturday? For no I mean, other reason than that. No, okay. <laughs> there's there's plenty of other reasons. Uh, All right, just they, make sure. for Duke sure. on Saturday. Yes, uh, that will be that. That's the norm, I think. I mean, uh, that's tradition. Yeah, maybe there's some UNC or maybe there's some NC State fans out there that that do it different, and I don't know, but. Uh, yeah, that's I that's think, a, anyone that is not financially incentivized to root for UNC is. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Plus that, and it'll just be for you know whoever's next in line to NC State at that point because they're they're both seven and four. NC State's eight and four. If NC State gets a win over Georgia Tech, they'll be nine and four, and and ahead of those two teams again. So, but yeah, there's I don't I don't know that there's been um, like as much or as little hype for a game for UNC and Duke in a, in a long time. I mean, they're both good teams, but neither one of them, you know, at that, that great level right now. So uh, no, they're both in the midst of restarting after, you know, Hall of Fame coaches leaving. So it's, that's kind of to yeah. be expected. Yeah, exactly. But one came in as the preseason number one overall team. So yeah, there is that, that. wasn't his fault though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. All right. So I think that just about wraps it up. Chris said here, he said, this team is special. I've not been excited about this for a long time. And I think that's, that's what you're getting the sense of again. You know, I saw somebody drop a question, uh, you know, about what, what did they have to do? Jeff said, uh, what, what does the pack need to do to have people show up students? Um, you know, students are one thing, but I was going to say, I mean, you know, the crowd tonight, I know it was sparse, but it was also a nine o'clock tip against a Florida state team that I think a lot of people knew they were just going to whoop their ass. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't read too much into the crowd on this one. You know, you'd love to see a big crowd for Saturday. We already know the UNC game, which is the, the next home game, which is like, you know, over a week past uh, the Saturday. I think it's two weeks away after after Saturday's game. It's the last home game for a while for NC State. Once they once that UNC game is already sold out, and then you have a Wake Forest game as well at home. Uh, and I want to say – there's one other there's one other home game as well outside of those. Yeah, but, Clemson on the 25th Clemson. at noon. Yeah. So I think all of those should be pretty well attended games uh given the time slots that they're in. So uh, we'll see over the next four games, you know, really how much this this fan base supports this team. Uh, and I think it'll I think it'll be a really good crowds for each and every single one of those given where this team is at right now. So All right, uh Miles any any parting shots from this one before we head out of here? No, nah, not really. Just an, just another quality win and uh, starting February off the right way. And they can't. It's a it's a classic look ahead spot 
on Saturday. You got a huge one on the road against a, a top t- 10, potentially top five team by the time you play them on Tuesday. You got the worst team in the league coming to Raleigh on Saturday at one o'clock. Handle business. That's all I Yes, got. exactly. That's a team that, you know, as we've talked about multiple times, plays that one, three, one defense, uh, which can be tricky. And, and we saw and they have, them two, and they have a few guards that can heat up. Like they're not, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're struggling this year. They're not a great team, but they have a few good players that can swing the outcome of a, of a game in a, in a 40 minute period. So, yeah. Similar to how NC state did to Virginia last year. So, uh, exactly. <laughs> you just never know. All right. Well, thank you again to everybody for listening. Uh, Miles, I appreciate you for jumping on as always, sir. No doubt. I'll see everybody soon. All right, guys. Well, thank you again to everybody for listening. Last thing I want to say here again, check out Scott Woods team, uh, his home learning team at scottwood.15.com. That's scottwood15.com. Uh, thank you again to everybody for listening. I think I've said that three times now. We will talk to you again soon.